Okay, we're back for another installment of Learning React. And um, yeah, I'll share my screen, pull up the slides, and we can get into it. Okay, so this week we are learning about class components. And we're going to be taking a version of a React project that has class components in it. And we're going to be refactoring those components from class components into functional components, which is the one that we've been learning all along that we're all used to by now. Um, so yeah, class components. Um, here's our agenda. So, oh wait, can everyone see my screen and hear me all right? I see it and yes. hear you. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so here's today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about just classes in general um, in JavaScript. Classes are a native JavaScript thing. Um, they're not just a React thing. And so i um, going to give you just kind of a high level overview of what classes are if you haven't seen them before. Um, I'm sure most of you have probably seen them or at least heard of them. Um, they're a pretty common paradigm or uh, structure in programming. It's almost like a function. And there's some programming languages that use classes for pretty much everything, uh, like Java. Java uses classes for everything. You can't write any code that isn't in a class, as far as I know. So uh, they're a big topic, but we're just going to be kind of scratching the surface on them, getting the most important parts. Uh, we're going to talk about just getting an overview of them. We're going to talk about constructors in classes, and then the this keyword. So there's a keyword in JavaScript called this, and it always makes for really interesting uh, conversation. It's hard to hard to figure out how to talk about this without it uh, sounding like you're just talking about some obscure this idea. Anyways, uh, then we're going to move on to React class components. So here, we're talking about JavaScript class components. Then we're going to move on to React class components. We're going to get an overview of them. We're going to talk about the render method on React class components. We're going to talk about props, state, and the component lifecycle. So these are all things that we uh, pretty much all these things, they have a direct translation into function components. And so you'll see basically how to create all the things that you've done in a function component, but in a class component. Um, they do the same thing. The syntax is just a little bit different. Um, and yeah, then we're going to do a summary, um, of everything that we've talked about. I'm going to give you some key takeaways and then we're going to get to coding. So I'll, uh, fork that repo that they have that, uh, we need to do refactoring and, uh, I'll do some refactoring and it'll be awesome. Okay. So uh, first topic is JavaScript classes. So if you haven't heard of classes before, um, they're basically, so it's a, a keyword in most programming languages, any programming language that supports object-oriented programming. It's another term you'll hear. Um, so a class is basically a blueprint for an object. So we've created plenty of objects at this point. Um, an object is a data structure that has uh, properties, which it's basically grouped variables. And so a property is a variable in an object, and uh, it'll have a key and a value. And you can also have methods on an object, which is basically a function, but that's what you call a function when it's inside an object, you call it a method. So we're used to seeing objects, classes 
are basically a blueprint for a certain type of object. So you're defining um, almost like a factory uh, for creating a specific type of object. So every object that you make using, for example, here we have a person class. Every object you make with this person class will have the same set of properties and methods. So it kind of gives you like a, a schematic, a well-defined um, framework for a type of object. And so here we have a person class and we're defining the class here. Um, the person class has a constructor and the constru we'll, we'll talk specifically about the constructor like next slide, but um, the basic idea is if you wanna create a person and you can see I'm instantiating it here, you say new person, so you refer to the name of the class, you say new and then the name of the class, and then you pass in whatever arguments that this constructor takes. And then you define, uh, if you create the class, then you define what these variables that you pass into the constructor do. But typically you'll make the variables that you pass into a constructor function or a constructor method, you'll typically make those um, You'll assign those as properties of the object that gets created. Um, and then you can have a method. And so basically any person you create will have a name, an off. age, and a method called say hi that you can call that will console log the name of the person. Um, there's a couple details in here that we'll kind of get to. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll uh, be able to understand every single part of this. Um, but yeah, the, the high level overview is you can define a class and it's used to create a specific shape of object. Uh, then you instantiate the class. So instantiating basically means creating a new object using that blueprint, that class. So you can create a bunch of different persons or people um, using the same person class. So the class is basically um, the framework for the thing. And then when you want to actually use the thing and create an object from it, um, you have to call new and then the name of the class and then pass in variables for the constructor. Um, and then me right here will end up being a person with a name and an age and a method to say hi. And here we can see I'm, so I'm passing in Rio, which will translate to the name, 27, the age, and then I can use it. So me dot say hi, and that will console log Rio, you can see, because I passed in Rio right there and say hi, will take the object and console log the name of that object. Okay, so that's kind of the overview and uh, we're gonna kind of break it down piece by piece here. So we're gonna start with the constructor. What does a constructor on a class do? Uh, constructors are special methods on classes. We use them to declare the initial state of newly created objects, which the initial state will be a set of properties on the new object. Mm -hmm. And they're called whenever a new object needs to be created. Okay, so the constructor is called, it's a function or it's a method that's called every time you create a new person or a new whatever the class is. So it's used in, well, constructing objects uh, of this class type. So anytime you create a new object using this class, anytime you instantiate an object is what, what you'll typically see, um, you, it implicitly calls the constructor. So we never have to call the constructor specifically on our own. Uh, the constructor gets called automatically when you use the new keyword. So I'm going back to my previous slide. This is the new keyword right here. So anytime you say new and then a class, 
that implicitly calls the constructor. And the constructor takes in, well, it can take in variables, it doesn't have to, or uh, parameters. Um, and then usually what it does is it assigns those parameters to become properties of the object. And you see this this operator or this this keyword. Um, I'll talk about that in the next slide. But um, so just remember the constructor is a, a method that's called on the class every time you create an object and it defines what properties the object will have. So a person will have a name and an age and the constructor is the one that's defining those properties. Um, and you can have any code in here that you want. You could say, anytime I create a new person, I want to, I don't know, um, you could log something to a database that says a new person was created. That would be like a, a side effect. If you remember that terminology, you'd have some like other thing that runs every time you create a new person. Uh, you could update like a person count if you had like a global variable that was keeping track of all the people. Um, every time you create a new person, this constructor will be run and it will define the properties for that new person. And this is what that looks like. So here we're using the class, we're creating a new person, we're passing in Rio, and that goes into the name, uh, the name argument or property in this, or uh, parameter. Sorry, too many words to keep track of. Uh, so Rio is an argument that goes into this name parameter. So Rio goes there, and then this dot name equals name is setting the person, the new person. You can think of this as saying the new person. They are going to have a property called name, and the value of that is going to be this parameter here. So you'll typically you'll see the same parameter name, like the name of the parameter and the name of the um, property are going to be the same typically. They don't have to. So I could say this dot first name equals name. I could say that uh, name here is referring to this parameter here. So I'm passing in Rio. Rio is getting set as the name. Passing in 27, which is getting set as the age. And now me is going to be an object that has a name property and an age property of these specific values. So person is basically um, creating a blueprint. And we anytime we create a person, it always has to have a name and an age. So we're never going to end up with a person that doesn't have a name and an age because the constructor tells us what values this needs to have. And it creates properties on that object. So every object created using a class should be the same or, or the same structure. It should have the same uh, properties. Um, and there's some caveats there. Like you can have constructor overrides or, you know, there's, you could have if statements in your constructor and, but, but the basic idea is that every object you create using a class should have the same structure. Okay. Now we've been seeing this. What is this? This is so confusing and weird, this. Um, so I, I tried to explain it. I, I tried to describe it in my slides, but I decided to go to uh, Google to help me out. So this is Google's answer, or W3Schools, that website you've probably ended up on. Um, they describe it pretty well. So what is this? In JavaScript, the this keyword refers to an object. OK, so this is an object. The this keyword refers to different objects depending on how it's used. OK, so it's an object, but it's a different object depending on how it's used. In an object method, this refers to the object. And we can actually see that if I go back. 
we have this say hi, which this is a method on a class, but it'll eventually become a method on the objects that are instantiated using this class. So this object, which is of type person, has the method say hi. And when we console log this dot name, well, when me console logs this dot name, this will be me. I know that's kind of confusing. This will be me at the time that you call me dot say hi. And me has a property called name. So you could imagine this being replaced with me.name when you call it right here. And me.name is Rio. So this, basically when you're creating a class and you want to refer to the actual instances of that class, which are the objects created using that class, when we're defining the class, we don't have access to those objects yet. Any object that's created using a class, the class doesn't have any awareness of those objects yet. And so we can't say me.name here because me is only one version of the, the person class. We could have me and you and you know a bunch of different objects created using this class. And say hi needs to always refer to the object that was created using the class. So this is always going to refer to the specific instance of that class. So anytime we say me dot say hi, if me has a name of Rio, and when we call say hi, this will become me. And then me dot name is going to be Rio. It's kind of weird, kind of confusing, kind of hard to get used to. But just remember, this is a way of referring to the object that a class can create, the actual instance of the object. And it does a lot of other things, too. So alone, this refers to the global object. OK, so if you were to just use this in JavaScript, you could console log this without being in a class or in, a, in an object method or anything. You could just console log this. You could have a JavaScript program where the whole program is just console log this. And I actually show you that right here. So here I'm in my, uh, if you don't know, your, when you open your dev tools, you can actually just write JavaScript code and it'll run. So I wrote console log this. And this in my browser is the window, the window object, which the window object has all of the, it's like the parent object of all JavaScript like code uh, that's, that's running in the browser. So it has access to uh, the document, which is where the DOM is, the document object model, and all sorts of other stuff. So any global, uh, JavaScript stuff values are in a uh, window. And I could actually do a quick demo of that. So let's go to google.com or any, any website, but let's do google.com. I'm going to pull up my console and I'm going to say, I'll zoom in here. Console.log this. And there we can see. So this is the same thing I was showing in my slide. This, when I just use it in this global scope, this refers to the window object, which has all this stuff on it. And we might see some stuff that we recognize. Uh, I don't know what most of this stuff means. I do know the document. Oh, body. Okay, so this would probably be the 
the body element, child nodes. Okay, so we're seeing our, our DOM here. So the window object has the DOM. What else? Event. So if there was an event, which there isn't one, but that would be like a click event, I assume. Same type of thing. Anyways, so the window object is the parent object of all objects in JavaScript in the browser. And so when we console log just this in that scope, then it's referring to that global object. When we console log this in the method of, of an object, this.name, it's actually going to refer to the object that owns that method. So it's like the enclosing scope. And that's a word that I said in here, I think. Yeah, so this is generally the enclosing object. So you can think of it as the parent. So when you say this, you're referring to the parent object where that code is running. And it's kind of hard to predict what this will always be uh, when you're first learning. Uh, I would just try console logging this in different contexts, like make a function within a function and the function calls another function in an object, in an array, and then call this and see what happens. It'll probably be um, the parent of wherever you, you call this. Um, and then there's all these other, these other things that uh, are contexts for this, where this will be something else. Um, methods like call, apply, and bind can refer to or can refer this to any object. So that's something that you've you've seen in the uh, lesson notes today. We don't actually have to use any of these things. Um, it is used in class components. You use bind, um, but it basically says when you are going to use a function or a method, you can actually change the this property for that specific method. Uh, so you can set the this property to be something else within that method. And that's something that uh, we don't actually have to, we don't have to do, but okay. So this changes on scope, based on scope. So here we have a cow, I'm creating a cow object. So this is this is an object created not using a class. This is just an object created like how we normally create a, just like a free form, whatever you want in here object. So this object has a name. This cow's name is Larry. And it has a method called who am I? And so when we want to know who this cow, who this cow is, uh, we can console log this, or, or we can call who am I and who am I console logs this. And this, within this scope here, um, it's going to refer to the cow. So I cons or I say cow dot who am I, and then it calls console log this. And this is what's returned. This is what's output. Um, we get an object with the name Larry and the met and a method that. Um, this is some JavaScript stuff that doesn't actually show our function. It just says that it is a function uh, called who am I. So this is what's console logged here. So this is an object with the name Larry and a method called who am I, which is cow, right? Cow is this object. Because cow has a name of Larry and a method called who am I. So this is our cow, and we don't refer to the cow, we refer to this. And this is just some arbitrary thing that happens to refer to the cow in this specific context. And that's why it's used in classes, because in classes, we don't know what object will own that method. We haven't created the object yet. We're creating a blueprint for the objects, and then what, whatever object calls the method this will refer to the specific instance of the object that um, owns that method. OK. Uh, we're almost done with this, I hope, I think. Can't remember how many more slides I have on it. 
Okay, this is commonly used in classes to refer to the specific instance of an object that the class creates. I think I said that like five times now. Uh, you can think of this as a way of accessing an object that hasn't been created that yet. I've also said that five times. Cool. Um, okay. Oh, we're still... Sorry, I, I'm really making this point here about this. Uh, I hope it sinks in, though. Um, <laughs> in constructors, this is used to set properties on the object, which would be... Okay, so that was all kind of theoretical about this. Here's the actual implementation here. Here's what you actually need to know. When you're using a class, you set the properties of that object. So in, in the constructor, you set the properties of that object by saying this dot and then the property. And then this will be the parent uh, object or whatever new object you're creating using this class. So this dot name, well, when I say me equals a new person, then it will be me dot name and then me dot age or whatever. So in your constructor, you you create new properties for any new object using this. In methods, you use this to access the created object's own properties. So the properties that belong to the object that this class created, um, those properties can be accessed via this. So assigning the properties, defining them, and then calling or referring to them, accessing them. OK, that was a uh, overview of JavaScript objects. And now let's, or JavaScript classes, uh, they're a blueprint for creating objects. Let's move on to React class components. And I'll stop just for a second uh, and let anyone, if anyone has any questions or anything, I'll open up the floor. Good. OK. OK, class components. So. Here we have a quick history lesson. Um, so React class components are the old ways of, it's the old way of making components in React. So, so far we've been using function components. Class components are actually the original way of making a component in React. Some projects still use class components, so it's good to know, but uh, you're probably not gonna be writing new code that uses class components. Uh, you just you might end up on a project once you go off into the world and get a job using React. Uh, you might end up on a project that still uses class components, so it's good to know. And you might have to refactor them into functional components to get with the times. So that's what we're doing today. Um, and this, she doesn't have anything to do with React or class components at all, but uh, I was just like, history, old, and she is Margaret Hamilton. She was the original software engineer. She actually coined the term software engineering. And she helped us uh, get to the moon, I think. This is a program that she wrote in like the, I don't know, 70s or something. And this is all code written by hand that they used to fly to the moon in like the first moon thing. So pretty cool. Side note, nothing to do with Hello. React. Hello? Hey. OK, so I sorry. I was trying to type on my question, and I recognize it'd be faster to ask. Um, So I just wanted to make sure. So basically, like, Sometimes I always get a little bit confused with like the the naming conventions, but basically, a class is kind of like this, ob basically a reusable object, and you can basically put anything with inside the instructor, and then you have a function that pulls out those things that are necessary, and then you you create a new version of it by doing the new whatever the name of that class is, and then give it the 
the the the not functions, but you give it the parameters that get shoved into the constructor, and then that's how the this knows what it's actually talking to because you've already named it like me, like you did, right? Is that is that how that works? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Okay. Yeah. So, and then, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, you can go and then I'll, I'll ask my next question. Oh, I was just gonna say it's important to think of classes as they're not a real construct in your language, like in your in your program. Um, they're abstract. It's like a, um, it's defining the shape of an object. It's defining what properties and methods an object will have. And then you use it to create an object for you. So it's like, hey, class, make me an object. And the object will have a specific set of properties that the class defines. The class itself does not have any of its own um, properties or any of its own methods or anything. It Well, I might confuse you by introducing you to static properties and methods. But that's what static properties and methods are. If you label a property or method as static, then it belongs to the actual class. So the class could be thought of as an object itself. Um, but in general, a class is an abstract concept that all it does is create objects for you. OK, so I wrote class is defining an object and needs the constructor. <laughs> Yeah, so That's... the constructor is like a function that makes the object for you. And you could just write a function that returns an object. Like in, in JavaScript, you could, maybe I'll do that to help clarify the point. So let's, let's say we have this person, this person class. Um, Let's say we want, so, so this person class helps us create a new person, and a person will be an object with a name and an age property. So we pass in a name and age, we get an object back with name and age. And let's forget about the method here. Let's delete that. So a person will create an object with a name and an age. Let's, let's just make a function that does that same thing. Function create person name, age, return. How about I'll create an object or a new const new person equals an object. So in this function, we're going to create an object called new person. New person is going to have a name that's the value of this name. So name equals name, and it's going to have age is age. So now we're creating this new object, and then we can return it. So now, if we want to create a person, const me equals create person. Rio 27, me will be an object with a name and an age of these values. So this is effectively doing the exact same thing as this class. This class is creating a person, defining the name and age, it's all the same. It's just return a class just returns an object, a new object with the properties that you define in the constructor. That's it's the same thing. It's just a different syntax of doing it. Okay. I think I think that makes sense. It's basically the class has nothing in it, but the constructor is what created an object that you can access. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So the person is almost you could almost view it as being a function that creates an object for you. Just like this.
and there's a, there's a few things that make it slightly different. Um, like, let's see, what else? Um, I think one thing is that, um, honestly, I, I don't think there's any like real significant difference. I think these do the same thing. And I think even as you get more uh, bigger classes, it's pretty much doing mostly the same thing. There's a way of doing, um, the original way of doing classes in JavaScript is JavaScript um, constructor function, object constructors. Sometimes we need to create many objects of the same type. To create an object type, we use an object constructor function. It is considered good practice to name constructor functions with an uppercase first letter. OK, so this is a constructor function. This is the old way of doing classes in JavaScript. And it's actually doing the same thing. So I can copy and paste that in here person, it's a function, takes in these properties, and it assigns this, the properties to this, which this and the scope of this function will be um, the actual function object, I think. Let's see. Actually, let's, let's try console logging this in here. And I'll call person. I'm going to comment that one out so don't get an error here. Uh, const me, or actually, I'll just say, yeah, yeah. Const me equals, you can't use new when you're just using a function like this, I don't think. And I could be wrong on some of this stuff. I wasn't around in the JavaScript days when you used constructor or object constructor functions because classes came out before I started using JavaScript. And now everyone uses classes in JavaScript, but it's, it does the same thing. Um, let's see what happens when I, when I say me person. I'm going to say uh, node chips. OK. Interesting. So this is actually going to be referring to the global scope here. What if I say new? Does that work? OK, yep. So you do use new when you're using a constructor function like this, I guess. Um, and then this refers to, well, an empty object that is person. I don't know. I can't. I can't. Uh, I don't know enough about object constructor functions to confidently talk about it, but just know that um, the idea of a class is that it's just creating an object for you. It's like a function that creates an object. Where was I? Okay. I, did that help? Yeah, super really clarified some things. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so classes. And it it's a big concept, honestly. And if you're like brand new to them, um, it'll take some getting used to. Um, they're they're like a whole thing. So uh you'll eventually be exposed to them enough times to where they'll really make sense and it's just repetition. It's just seeing it and starting to understand it better. But yeah, there's the basic overview of classes. Uh, so let's talk about how React started. In the beginning, React used classes. Um, and just as a side note, here's a cool documentary about React. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll post a link to it. We're not going to watch it because it's very long. It's over an hour long. Um, 
But this is a really interesting documentary about React, if you're curious. I'll post it in the chat. Um, gives you some context on how it all began. Um, OK, so at the beginning, we had classes. And they do the same thing as a functional component. Um, they're just the older and they're kind of harder to write. They or they just take up more syntax. It, it's long. It takes up more code to do the same thing. So, but they do the same thing as functional components. So, here's a functional component called to do, and it receives props and it returns some JSX, an li, a list item, and then props dot title. So you can pass in a title prop to a to-do, and then the to-do will render the, the title. Here's that component as a class. So this is the same thing. It's going to do the same thing. And actually, when you, when you use this class, just like how when you use a functional component, you use it by writing it in JSX. So you'd make like an opening and closing tag for your to-do. Uh, or just an opening tag, whatever. Um, for classes, it's the same thing, the way that you call them. So you, they turn into JSX, basically. Um, so the syntax is class to do. This is a weird one, extends component. What that is is inheritance. So when you start learning about classes and objects, and something called object-oriented programming, um, you'll learn about inheritance. And what inheritance is, is basically one class can actually inherit a set of properties and or methods from another class. So our to-do is actually going to inherit a set of properties and values from this component class. Um, component comes from React, so we actually have to import component from React. And then any new class we make, any new class component has to extend React's component class, and that gives it some added functionality. That's what tells React this is a component um, and makes it all possible. OK. so. We have a constructor, which we didn't have in a functional component, right? So a constructor in a, a class component can receive props. And then you have to call super, which super is another keyword. I know we're learning a lot of new keywords in JavaScript. Super is the it's what you use when you're inheriting from another class. And what it does is it calls the constructor of the class you're inheriting from. So we could basically imagine calling new component and then passing in this props value. So super calls the constructor and creates a new object using the class that you inherited from. So it's a thing that you use only with this extends keyword when you're doing inheritance is you call super in your constructor. It's just something you have to do. When you're inheriting from another class, you call super. And then you pass in props into super. And it'll look the same way um, most times. Uh, but you probably won't write any class components in your life. I haven't. This is my first time. So don't worry about it. Um, and then uh, a class component is going to have a render method. And the render method does basically what our function component does. It returns some JSX. So in our render method, we return some JSX. And that's what actually gets rendered. Whereas in a function, it just whatever you return in, in your function component gets rendered. So here, our, in a class component, our render function is equivalent to the return of the function. So we return JSX. And then to refer to props and stuff, uh, you'll see this.props.title. So you'll start seeing this.
come up all the time in class components. Okay, so the render method is where you return JSX. It's always called render. You make a new class and you have a, a method on it called render. It's a special name for it. Okay, props. Props are passed into the constructor and then into the base class component. So component is our base class that we're inheriting from. And we call super and pass in props because whatever this component is that React made, or, or whatever this class is that React made called the component, that needs to have our props. It needs to know about them because React is going to do fancy things behind the scenes with these props. It's going to make it all work. So React is taking care of all this. And the, the thing that we have to do is say extends component and then call super in our constructor. Um, and then our props can be referenced using this. So this.props.title. And the reason we can refer to this and still access props, even though we never defined a property, like we never did this.props equals props. We never set the actual, we never set any properties in this component. And it's because when we call super, this component gets merged, all the properties and methods of this base component get merged with our new, with the one that we're defining here. So React's base component is actually in charge of assigning uh, a bunch of properties to this. So this will have a props property because it extends component and component is assigning props to, uh, yeah, that's how that works. So props are, yeah, props are accessed using this. Okay, another thing about class components is that they can't use hooks. So hooks came around to solve some problems with functional components. Functional comp or function components originally couldn't have state. They couldn't have their own state. They were pretty basic and bare bones. And so you had to use uh, class components for most of your stuff. And then you'd use function components uh, when you didn't have to have. Hi, what do I do? Do I just drive all the way up to the front? Uh -huh. um, so you used to have to have class components for managing state and then function components, which just return JSX. And now function components have hooks like use state, use effect. And these hooks um, basically give your function components the same functionality that class components always have. So class components have their own way of doing use state, use effect, all those things. You can't use hooks the same way in a class component. So what do we, what do, we do instead of these hooks? Well, here, instead of use a, or use state, um, we assign the state in the constructor. So here's our function component. We're creating some state. We have a noodles state and a sauce state on our pasta function or our pasta component. And then we're saying use state and we're assigning noodles the value of spaghetti. We're assigning sauce the value of tomato. In our class component, this is the a class component that does the exact same thing. We have a pasta component, all the same stuff. It returns some noodles. Um, to create state in a class component, you do it in the constructor, which kind of makes sense, right? That's what we've been talking about is constructors are where you create the, the variables, the methods, the or the uh, properties on an object. So in our pasta component, in the constructor, we say this dot state equals an object and then noodles and sauce. So here we're saying 
noodles as a used state thing and sauce as a used state thing, and they're separate. When you're doing a class component and you're creating state, all of your state has to be together in an object called state. So any state that your component has has to be in this property called state. If not, then it doesn't work. So you need to have this dot state and it has to be an object. So you can't store state as individual variables like we did in function components. In function components, you can make a new state uh, using use state and you can make a bunch of them and they're all like fully separate from each other. In a class component, they're all in an object together. They're all properties in an object together. And you have to create it in the constructor function like that. So that's creating state. Um, accessing state in a function component, you just refer to the variable that you get back from use state. So use state will return, well, spaghetti in this case for noodles, and then we just call noodles and noodles will be spaghetti. Um, in our class component, it's basically the same. It's just a little different. We have to use some dot accessors. Um, we have to refer to this again, and then we have to do dot state, and then we get our property noodles. So here we have, in a function component, you just refer to your state on its own, noodles. In a class component, you have to do this dot state dot, and then whatever, whatever that variable is. So this dot state dot noodles, that's accessing state. Okay, now modifying state. So with our function components, we have use state, which returns our state variable, which we only use to read that, that state value. And then the setter, which we use to modify it. So remember with use state, we would get the variable and then the setter for that variable, the function that we use to change it. And we can't just say noodles equals a new value because React won't trigger a, a new render cycle. It won't um, actually change that state variable. Um, so we use these setters. So set noodles to noodles plus sauce. In a class component, you also have to use a setter for your state. So you can't say this dot state equals and then a new value. You actually have to call a new method that we haven't seen before called this dot set state. And it kind of makes sense, right? Like. In a function component, we have set noodles or set sauce. We have set and then whatever the name of that variable is, that state variable. And you can actually decide the name of these functions to be whatever you want. But the tradition is you say set and then the name of the variable. Here in a class component, since all of our state is together in a single object, the method we use is actually just called set state. And set state is provided to us by React. We don't actually have to make this method. So this comes from component. Another feature of inheritance. We get set state for free. React gives it to us. And set state, so we say this dot set state. And then we can set a new value for, we, we pass in an object. Set state has to be passed in an object because our state is an object, right? And then any new properties on this object uh, will be added to the state object or will change the state object. And basically what you wanna do is say the parameter, so, so you're creating a new object here that you're passing into set state. The new object will actually be merged with the existing state. And what that means is it's not gonna override our state. So this dot state is not gonna become this new object. It's actually gonna be merged with this object. And the reason for that is if 
this became our new object. And anytime we set state for any of these properties, it would, we'd have to rewrite all the, the existing state. All the existing state would still need to be in this object. But here we're creating a new object that we, we typically only want to change one state variable in this. And so we can uh, refer to, we can create an object with just one parameter or one uh, property. And the property will be one of the properties that already exists in our state and then a new value for it. And then our state We'll still have all of, all of its existing properties, but then the one that you define in this new object will be changed. It'll be updated. I know I just said a lot. Um, basically, just remember set state gets an object passed in with any properties that you want to update. And you can leave out any properties that you don't want to change. Those ones will stay the same. And that's because this object is going to be merged with our existing state. And it'll only change the properties that need to be changed that are defined as new values in here. OK, so that's modifying state. So we, we went through creating state, accessing state, and modifying state. And that's that's all we need, right? Pretty much. So uh, we now can do all the same state management stuff that we did in our functional components. We, we know how to do those in React or uh, class components now. OK, so, so that's the first challenge in our new class component thing. We can't use use state. Um, what's another thing? Well, use effect. We can't use use effect. And I got really lazy with this slide because I was running out of time. Um, so don't worry about this slide. Don't worry about memorizing any of this. Just remember, we can't use use effect in a class component just the same way that we can't use use state. So instead of use effect, we use these things called lifecycle component method things. Um, so one of them is called component did mount. And so, so remember, these are methods that you can include on your object that um, run during certain times in its life cycle, the component's life cycle. And they actually replace or use effect uh, does the same thing, basically. So component did mount is the same thing as a use effect with an empty dependency array. It's called on the first render, but not subsequent ones. So when your component first renders, it'll call component did mount. So you can write any code that needs to happen when your component first renders. But then on re-renders, when the state changes and it re-renders, it won't run any of that code again. And in, in function components, the way you solve that is with a use effect with an empty dependency array. So here we can see use effect. Use effect takes in a callback function, right? And sometimes it'll span multiple lines, so it looks different than this, but same idea. This is code that's going to execute when your component mounts or loads originally, and then not on re-renders. Uh, and this is useful for, like, you want to call to a database once. And then when your component re-renders with new state, you don't want to be calling to that database every time. So uh, we say use state or use effect, and it only runs it once when the component first mounts. That's component did mount, and then there's component did update, and component will unmount. So component did update is called when a component state is updated. It's the same thing as a, a use effect with some uh, state variables in the dependency array. So when these state variables change, it runs the use effect. Component did update does the same thing. It runs some code when the state changes. And then component will unmount uh, does the same thing 
as the cleanup function in use effect, which I haven't even shown you the cleanup function in use effect. You typically don't need uh, to use it. There are just specific cases where you do. Um, basically in a use effect, a use effect, the callback function inside of it can actually return a value, which we haven't done that before, but you can return a value in a use effect in the callback. And the value that you return will be a function. <laughs> so it's another function inside a callback function. Um, but basically that function you return in a use effect is a cleanup function. And it is code that runs whenever your component unmounts, whenever your component's about to uh, go away. And that could be like, if you have um, like a timer, running in a function, and you don't want that timer to continue running, which if you haven't seen, you can do a timer in JavaScript. It's uh, called set interval, and it's just a default JavaScript thing. So if you want to have a timer running in a function or in a, in a component, uh, that would be an example of, oh, the component unmounted, actually throw away that timer, or otherwise it'll just keep on going. Um, and you don't need to know these for the assignment today. And you might not ever need to know them. Well, maybe eventually. It depends on how much React you do and how much uh, legacy code. If you've heard the term legacy code, legacy is referring to old, outdated, or it's code that's it's uh, been around for a long time. And it's annoying because it's old. And old things are annoying. Just kidding. Um, old code is can be tough to work with, though. OK, let's do a summary. So key takeaways, um, JavaScript classes. So classes are like blueprints for objects. So a class, remember, it's basically like a function that creates an object for you. Constructors are special methods on classes used to set the initial properties of objects instantiated by the class. So classes and constructors, constructors are part of what makes classes possible. Constructors are basically what set the initial values of objects that are created using that class. So constructors help you create the objects that a class wants to create. Um, and then this, can be confusing. It's always changing the value. The value of this is always different. And you can call it whenever, wherever you want. But it's always going to refer to something different. And basically, it refers to the object that's created by a class. So in, in a class, when you refer to this, it's going to refer to the instance of that class, or the object that was instantiated using that class. So it helps you define the properties and methods of the objects um, that a class creates. So here's an example of a person class in vanilla JavaScript. We have class person, uh, curly braces. You have a constructor. It looks a lot like an object. But remember, it's not creating an actual object. It's just creating. Um, basically a function that creates objects for us. So we have a constructor. Every class needs a constructor. I'm pretty sure. I think so. Um, and the constructor is what actually sets the values of any object created by this class. So we can, or the properties. So if we want our person to create people and the people are going to be objects that have a name and an age, then the constructor is where we define that. So when we say new person, and then we pass in uh, name and age, the constructor is actually what receives those values that we pass in and sets them as properties on the object. And then classes can also have methods, and the methods are going to be um, methods that exist on every object that we create using the class. So every person that we create will always have a name, an age, 
and a say hi method. It's like a, a blueprint or a template for an ob a specific type of object so that we can create a bunch of objects that all have the exact same uh, shape. OK, there's a lot on this slide, but we're almost at the end. Um, we're just going to quickly run through all these key takeaways of React class components. So React class components were replaced by functional component. And I'll update, or I'll, uh, I'll post the slides on Slack. And you can also feel free to like screenshot these if you want, but just running through all the all the points that I made in the lecture. So class components were replaced by functional components, but they're still around in older code bases. Um, so you might have to, it, it's good to know uh, how to use class components if you need. Um, the render method is where you return JSX. So in a functional component, you just return it. In a class component, you use the render method to return JSX. Um, props are passed into the constructor, and then you call super. Class components can't use hooks. So anytime we're trying to keep state in a function component, we use use state. And when we're using effects, we use use effect. Those things are different in uh, class components. So instead of use state, state is created in the constructor. Remember, we say this dot state equals an object with a bunch of state. And state is updated using the set state method. So when we want to change the state, we call set state and pass in an object with new values for the state. Instead of use effect, so that was instead of use state. So that's how we manage state in a com uh, class component. And then instead of use effect, this is for handling side effects, which is uh, in most cases, uh, you can think of it as uh, making a fetch call, doing some asynchronous code, uh, calling to a database or an API. Um, so a side effect, uh, you use lifecycle methods, which allow for effects. So at certain points in the component lifecycle, you can have certain things go on. Uh, you can have it basically have some code that runs only when the component first mounts, when it updates, or when it unmounts, and not every single render. Um, Props state and use state are accessed using this. So we learned about the this keyword. And this refers to the properties or methods of an object in the scope of wherever you use this. And here, whenever we're creating class components, we have to use this to access the props, the state, and the use. Uh, Actually, I shouldn't have said use state. I should say set state there. Because remember, use state is for function components. Set state is for class components. OK. And then here's just that example of that class component pasta. So it has a constructor, passing in props, calling super on the props. We're setting some initial state. We're calling the render function, which returns some JSX. We have to use this when we refer to the properties on it and, or the state. And then we have a method on it, uh, which handler functions. I guess I didn't have a specific slide for this, but um, Handler functions in a function component are just functions that you declare in the component body. Here, we um, create separate methods for handler functions. So this would be an, a handler function called add sauce, and it sets the state to, uh, let's see, it adds noodles and sauce together, basically. 
okay, it's the end of the lecture. Uh, I know that was, it's always a lot. I always say that. It's a lot every time. How's everyone feeling on this stuff? It's not a lot. It was great. It was um, a really good explanation about all the stuff that was in the lesson. I'm glad. Yeah, thanks, Hiro. Yeah. As, uh, as usual, um, really understandable, like in a matter of like how to use and um, everything else. I have like maybe a philosophical question. Sure. Um, why why they just switched from class components to functional components? Because for me, like I have experience with object oriented programming. For me, using class components like it's so much easier than with functional components. It, for me, it looks so simple with class components and uh, like I can't understand why they why they just switched back like or not back but from class to functional. Yeah, um, I guess because you have more experience in object oriented programming, I assume that's why it's easier. Um, I do agree there's specific things of it that are easier, like the, I, I think use effect specifically can be pretty confusing in functional components, like the hooks and React components can be kind of confusing. Um, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, it's less code. Like I know, um, am I still screen sharing? I am, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, where's the, the actual, oh, here. Okay, the actual code for a class component is like longer. It takes more code. I'll actually, let's do, I, I solved the code earlier today for the assignment just to like go over it. And I was curious, so the function here, so this is this is what we're gonna be refactoring today. We're going to refactor this class, which is pretty big. We're going to refactor that. And we can actually see uh, how big it is. What does it say? Maybe I have to zoom out. Yeah. OK. 1,631 characters selected. 1,631. And then the function component. 1067. So it's about 600 lines of code less, or, or uh, not lines of code, uh, 600 characters less in a function component. Um, you don't have to have a specific method for the render function, which is nice. And you don't have to use this all the time, which can get confusing. And then there's also something that in a class component you have to do, you have to bind these lines are required to make the methods slash functions declared on this class have the correct this object when they run. So you have to use bind on um, handler methods, which can be confusing. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it's a it's a taste it, thing. It, it's a taste, yeah, yeah. Because like uh, using this, it's like one of the most obvious things that most transparent things in object oriented programming. So. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, lo not lines of code, but characters. Uh, it's uh, like, we, we can't measure our uh, like engineer uh, like qualification or job done or something like that, just in characters or line of codes. If, uh, for example, if I need to write um, a little bit more uh, characters or line of code, but the code will be understandable and more maintainable in the future by myself and uh, other folks in the team. Uh, it will be a preferable way to, to write more code uh, to make it uh, more maintainable, if it is a case, of course. I agree. Yeah, I've, I've heard people say the term expressive code. Or wait, maybe that's the opposite. I think, I don't know. There, there's a style of code that is like, the more detail you add, the better. So like certain programming languages require you to like, like 
for example, in JavaScript, there's no types. So mm -hmm. every variable can be assigned a number. And then in the next line, you can assign it a string. And then in the next line, you can assign it an object or even a function. It's very like loosey goosey about what any property or, or what, what any um, variable can be. And in other programming languages like Java or C or C++, um, they're typed, which means every, um, every variable has a specific type and you need to conform to those types. And classes are actually really like classes and types are kind of one in the same. They go hand in hand and uh, in object oriented code, if you don't have types, um, it can definitely make for confusing code. Um, I, yeah, I'd say there's been this big push over the past, I don't know how long, from object oriented programming to functional programming. Um, object oriented programming, which has a really like heavy lean on using classes, uh, that's been like the dominant way of programming for since like the 90s. Um, and there's a lot of people who are like insistent that that is the one true, you know, paradigming programming. And then there's been this whole new crop of people who love functional programming. And uh, most people probably who advocate for functional programming, they probably don't really know true functional programming because, um, well, they know some degree of it. Uh, functional programming can be difficult from what I've seen, um, but so can object oriented. They, they both have their own uh, strengths and weaknesses. And I'd say there's like, um, yeah, there's good, good and bad to both. Um, functional probably tends to be less actual writing. Like you actually have to type less code, whether that's a good thing or not. Yeah, know. but it could be, as you've said, uh, it could be really difficult to like to use functional programming, like at least if you do that properly. Yeah. Because uh, this is not functional programming that we are looking at. Yeah, React is kind of like it's, a... it's procedure uh, style. It's not functional program. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, the the way that people typically write and learn JavaScript and React code, it's kind of like a mixture of all three. Um, and for me, like so far, it's worked out pretty well. So um, I'm curious. I, I bet if you were to ask me in five years, what I think functional versus procedural versus uh, object-oriented, I might have a totally different uh, opinion on it. Um, I think there's value in all of them. And um, I'm happy to hear that you like feel like very aligned with one of them because it's good to learn one and get good at it and like feel comfortable with, you know, cause, cause you can solve problems uh, in different ways, but if you learn object oriented really well, I think you can probably become a really good programmer, and that's a good thing. So, yeah, it's, it's like it's cool to have like different options, but uh, as as I understood, uh, uh, they, I mean, React uh, inventors, yeah, uh, they uh, they just pushed us from uh, class components to functional ones. And we, we can do anything for now if you want to <laughs> stay up to date. Uh, you need true. to use only functional ones and it's like so- I think the community, I think the community kind of helped make that choice though. Because we all adopted functional components. I don't think they made us do it. Maybe because I, uh, I, I don't know, I was not familiar with uh, React uh, that period of time when it was a switch. Yeah. yeah. It, it's just my perspective from from this moment. Well, I, yeah, I'm happy to hear, like, I, I think there's uh, definitely, like, use in both of them. And uh, you could definitely have a full-on uh, modern React code base using class components. And so if that's what you're more comfortable with, then definitely.
uh, do it. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to coding. How does everyone feel about that? Coding, coding is good. Um, so we have this. Actually, I'll. I I'm kind of debating. Should I? Maybe I'll do it from the beginning. I'll actually fork. I'll fork the repository that they have, so I can show you like how to actually do it from the start because. I think I sometimes skip the Git stuff, and that can be um, if you don't see the Git stuff, then you might not learn Git very well, and you might get confused. Um, OK, so they have this code base for us, this new project, um, and they want us to clone, or they want us to fork the project which basically means create a new version of this project on our GitHub account. We're basically copying it over to our GitHub account. Then we're gonna clone it from our GitHub account onto our computer. And then we're gonna fix it or not fix it. We're gonna change the class components um, to functional components, which might be breaking it according to uh, Anton. <laughs> Depends on personal preference, whether we're fixing it or breaking it. Um, so I'll show you how to do that. We're going to go to this lesson. The repository to fork is right here. So I'm going to copy that link, open it in a new tab. I'm going to click fork. And we can actually rename this version of it. It'll be renamed on our account. So I could say like uh, my cool fork of React guessing game V. Choose owner. Oh, shoot. I already, OK. I forked it already. I forked it all up. <laughs> uh, I forked it, and I guess uh, it won't let me do it again. So pretend that I, I forked, and then I went to my, my fork, and I said, uh, where is it? Right here, code, copy to clipboard. So I copy this link, and then I clone it to my computer. Go into my terminal. You all can see my screen still, right? OK. Git, clone, that. URL, make sure you're in the right place when you do that. Don't just do it uh, willy-nilly, because that'll make a folder wherever you do it. I mean, you can always go into your file explorer and, and change the location, but OK. So imagine I just cloned this down. This is the project. Uh, actually, I need to switch to, you don't have to do this, but I just already completed this assignment. So I'm switching to a branch where I, I cloned it before I completed it. So, or I, I made a new branch. That's the the version that you will get. So this is this is the state of the the, the project. Um, and the first thing to do, they they say something in the in the assignment about uh, npm install and or or uh, replacing any instance of yarn start with yarn dev or npm run dev. Uh, I didn't have this problem with it. And I don't think you will either. I think you don't have to worry about any of this. Or actually, what you do have to worry about is run npm install. So npm install. And what that does is it installs all of the third-party code that allow it to work. So React is a third party library. So it installs that, it installs a bunch of other things too. You can actually see what are the dependencies right here. We have React and React DOM and then dev dependencies. These are dependencies that are um, only used when you need to develop the application, but they're not used in like the final version that's built and shipped out to end users. Uh, so. 
React and React DOM, these are the dependencies. So npm install, and it installs React. Familiarizes yourself with the code. So um, the current version of the app is a mix of class components and stateless function components. Take some time to look over the structure of the application so that you understand how it's constructed. So we're just going to look at this app, kind of get familiar with the code base. There's some class components and some function components. The class components in the current version are number, guessing game, and guess control. These are the components that you'll be converting to function components. With hooks, the existing function components don't need any changes. So there's just these two components, number guessing game and what else? Number guessing game and guess control. These are the two components that we're going to be converting from class components into function components. And you might be getting uh, these, these squigglies, and that is ESLint complaining. That's our linter, which is basically checking for code formatting stuff. Um, it's not going to break your code. It's not going to give you any errors or anything. It's going to look like it, but that I remember that's just like a style thing. So ESLint makes sure that like, you know, it has uh, specific preferences for how your code is styled. Like if you have a bunch of spaces like that, it'll be like, ah, no, I don't like that. Or I guess it's fine with that. But certain things, uh, it's not going to affect the way your code runs. It's just a style thing. Don't worry about those uh, so far. And, and if you want to get rid of them, you can actually go to eslintrc.cjs and find ignore patterns. And you can delete everything in here. This will get rid of all of our lint. It'll make it so we're not doing any linting checks anymore. You can just replace that with a star, and I'll say ignore all files. You do that if you want. Um, you could also probably uninstall ESLint, but I don't want to do that. So now we won't have any of those squiggles. They're gone. OK. So we're replacing these class components. Let's, and I actually, I don't think I need to really, yeah. So, th so they have this step-by-step -step guide. I didn't even look at it because I wanted to try this on my own. I was just learning about class components too. So we're all figuring it out together. Um, let's, let's look at the code and see what's going on. So, or actually let's, let's run the app. NPM run dev. And if that doesn't work, then make sure you run npm install first. And then npm run dev. This actually starts our app up being served up on a local server that we can access through localhost, blah, 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 5173. And it's a guessing game. And I'm thinking let's all play this game together just to start. What do you think? Does anyone know the secret sauce for the a, a strategy for being successful at a game like this? You could start with guessing the number that's right on the middle. So you could do like 50. Yeah, by the by the research chip. Exactly. Yep. Yep, both of you are right. It's so there's this thing you probably will, you know, you if you haven't learned yet, you're learning now in programming. Uh, this idea of a binary search, which basically means if you have data that's ordered, like numbers, so like one through a hundred, uh, if you have a bunch of things that are like a bunch of numbers that are one through a hundred, um, and they're all sorted, and you have a specific set of data that's somewhere in there, the best way to go is find the middle point and guess that. If you can determine whether it's higher or lower, then go like split it into two, go to the part that that number you're trying to find is in, and then guess that middle point. So you keep on splitting the section that it could be in, determining whether it's higher or lower, and then guessing the middle point. So 
I hope that was a good explanation. Well, you'll see how it works. So um, I need someone to offer me up a number using binary search. 50. Yep. Perfect. So 50 is in between. So, so the number we're trying to guess is between one and 100. And so we want to start by guessing the middle point. So the middle point, and, and this is basically a strategy for uh, like a computer algorithm will use this for finding data at the most efficient way. So like at, at the very low level in your computer, like all the like heart, like operating system level code um, that has to be really efficient, really fast. And it's just these nitty gritty algorithms. Binary search is something that's probably happening in your computer all the time. Your computer is trying to find data and it's out of a sorted set of data. And so this is the technique to get to that data the fastest is you guess the middle point. Then we determine if we were too high or too low. So your guess was a little above the number. Okay. We're going to ignore the, if it's a little or a lot, we're just going to, for now, we're just going to say, okay, our guess was above the number. So we know we guessed 50, so we know it's not 50. We know it's somewhere between 1 and 50. So what else can we guess that's in the middle? 25. Point? 25, yep. So that's the middle point between the section that we know it's in. Your guess was well below the number. OK, so we guessed 50, and we were too high. We guessed 25, and now we're too low. So we know it's in between 25 and 50. Let's do the same thing. Let's have the, the section of 25 and 50. So that's 25. Uh, the, the difference of 25 and 50, there's 25 numbers that it could be in there. Or I guess not inclusive, but let's imagine it's 25. So 25 divided by 2. 12.5. 12.5. And then plus 25. plus 25. You didn't get 37.5, but you can't get 0.5, I don't think. So you could yep. do 37 or 38. Yep. So let's let's round up. 38. That is the midway point between in this current section that we know it's in. Okay, your guess was a little below the number. Okay, so now we know that it so basically the idea is every time we're cutting off the biggest chunk that we possibly can given the data that we know, given the information we have. So we just, we're splitting it in half every time. So now 38, we know it's between 38 and 50, right? We're a little low, so between 38 and 50, let's find the midway point. We can even get out a calculator for that. Unless someone wants to do some quick mental math. Does anyone have the number? What's the midway point between 28 and, or? What was it? 38, right? So I know it's above 25 and below 38. Uh, and uh, half of 25 is 12.5. Uh, and then half of 12.5 would be 6.25. So then if you did 38 minus 6, you would get 32. So I think we're going get... above. I, th I think we need between 38 and 50. It's 12, oh, you're right, you're 12 right. divided by 2, so it's 6. Then it's uh, 38 plus 6, 44. 44? Okay. Shoot. Okay, so we have one more guess. Your guess was a little below the number. Okay, we have one more guess. So I, I played this game a few times before, and... It it is you pretty much have to factor in the little or a lot if you want to like actually. So so we can do it one more time after this. We'll do a quick round after this. So now we we are between forty four and fifty. Yeah? Yep. <clears throat> so yep. that's six. the middle will be forty seven. Forty seven. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shoot. Okay. So we at least yeah, narrowed it down to six to, numbers. Yeah, we need to keep in mind that little or yep. just So let's down. do that again. So we're going to do a speed round. 50. Our guess was well well below the number. So it's between 50 and 100. So let's uh, do the midway point, 75. 
Okay, so now we see a little, and actually, if we look at the code, I only know this from looking at the code. If we go to the guest control and we look at, or wait, number guessing game, this component. Uh, guest message, sorry. <laughs> if we look at the guest message component, here's, here's the messages we get. Your guess was well above, your guess was a little below. Okay, if the distance apart is greater than 10, so we know that if the distance apart, if, if our number is 10 away or greater than 10 numbers away, then it says um, well above or well below. If it's within 10, then we get um, a little above or a little below. So we know that 10 is what separates us from being well above or well below or a little above or a little below. So a little above the number, and what was our guess? 75, right? Or no? Yeah, we had guessed yeah, yeah, 75. 75. And then before that, I think we guessed 50. So, yep. um, so we're a little above at 75. That means we're between 75 and 65, right? I think it was 75 and 50. Well, we're, we're taking into account a little above which if we're a little above, then that means we're within 10. Oh, okay, you're right. So it's now between 75 and 85, yeah? Try uh, 70. Oh, uh, 65. 75 and 65. So yeah. try 60, let's try 60. 70. No, 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 70. No, no, 70. Oh, 70. 70. 70. <laughs> 70, between 70. Okay, we're still a little above. So now we know it's between what, 65 and 70? Uh, so let's do 60. Above. 67. 67. Six, six, 68 sounds good. Let's do 67, and then we can do 68. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we got it. Amazing. Good job, everyone. So that was fun, right? We we played the guessing game and we won because we are smart and we're using our amazing brain power. Um, so yeah, that's, if, if you can do that, if you can understand all that, then you are destined to be a, an amazing programmer. That's really what it takes, you know, breaking down a problem, understanding the rules and then solving it. It's like a, a puzzle. Uh, Okay, so now we understand how the game works, right? Let's see the actual code for it. So the app component, well, this is the same as the app component in most React apps. It's going to be pretty much just pretty basic. We don't have to really do anything. Uh, and actually, I didn't even notice before, but I guess this is a class component. We don't. It doesn't want us. We don't have to replace this with a functional component. Um, app calls guess number game and in vs code you can highlight and press option or alt and then click on that and it'll bring you to the, the file so 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 basically our our app component or our main component this is like our most parent this is our parent parent component and then we have our parent component which is app and nothing really goes on in either of these. It's just like setting us up to have some stuff. And then our first like real component that has our like app code is this number guessing game component. So in here we have a function that returns a random integer from one to 100 inclusive. Okay, so this is just, this function, this is not a component. It's just used within the component. This is outside of anything. This is just like a utility, like a helper function. And all it does is get a random number. So that's the number that we get when we're guessing, or, or when we're guessing a number. This function gives us that original number. Um, this is a constant, max attempt equals five. So we could probably change that and then get more guesses if we wanted. Um, and you'll typically see in, in code, I was going to say in JavaScript, but in code in general, when you have a constant that is like 
a specific number and it's a number that's kind of like I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. There's certain certain times where you use all caps for uh, the name of a variable. And it's basically referring to things that are not only just a constant, as we think of in programming, like const, but they're a constant, like, they're never, ever going to change. And, and they're kind of like a either a universal constant, like pi. Pi would be one. That's always going to be 3.14 and, you know, things like that. And then you also might have something like max attempts, which you are setting this number and it's not derived by anything. Uh, that's kind of just a convention. You, you, for values like that, you, uh, you don't want it to be what's called a magic value, which a magic value in programming would be like some number just appears randomly out of nowhere. Like we could even take this 100 and say like const, I'm going on a tangent here. I hope that's okay. I'll try to get through this. Max number equals 100. We could even do that and then replace this 100 with that and then replace that with min number. That would be like good convention, good style in code is um, when you have numbers that seem like kind of arbitrary or random or values that seem arbitrary or random, uh, make sure you label them and use like that type of thing. Okay. So we have a class component with a lot of stuff going on in it. And honestly, we could look at how this game works, how the actual code works, but we don't really have to in order to complete this assignment. Um, let's just start refactoring. Uh, we can we can get started right now. And what I'll start with is I'm going to show you a little. I came up with a. Um, let's see where do I. Have? I came up with a system for um, at least in this app how to re how to refactor a class component to a function component. So I have a little system, and I'm just going to put that in here. So steps for refactoring class components to functional components, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it with this class. We're going to make this class component a functional component, and then we're going to do it to one other one, guest control here. So these are the steps that I have outlined. And maybe I'll put this in the chat, too, in case you want it. We're just going to be following this. There it is in the chat. OK, so the first step is we're going to create a new empty functional component. So it's going to be the same name, and we're just going to like start one by one replacing parts of this class component um, with this. Or we're going to build this functional component to be the same thing. So function number guessing game, right? Number guessing game. And we're going to run into an issue where these both have the same name. So let's just call this number guessing game funk for now. And then eventually we'll, uh, we'll delete this because we'll have recreated it as a function component. So we're just going to step by step recreate this component in this number guessing game functional component. So Let's see, we created an empty function component. Now let's let's address the render method. So the render method is gonna be replaced with just a return. So this function itself, remember in, in a class component, you have to call the render method and a functional component, you just return your JSX. So let's go to this class component. Let's find the render function or the render method. Here's the render method. And it returns some JSX, but then it also does a couple other things. Is correct guess, blah, 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 is game over. So this is just deriving some um, Boolean values, basically, that help us with rendering stuff correctly. Um, 
And these actually, these can just go in the body of our functional component. So I'm just going to take the entire body of this render method. I'm going to copy the whole thing. Copy. And paste it into our functional component. Perfect. OK. So that that's how you do that part. And, and maybe I'll do a little emoji check mark. Oh. <laughs> Looked up emoji in the emoji picker. Oh. Okay. So we did that. We created an empty functional component. We replaced the render method with a return. And now, step three uh, we're going to take the props and replace it with props. It's mostly the same. Props are mostly the same. So we have props in the constructor. And instead of in the constructor and calling super in a function component, we just pass them into the component itself as an argument, props. Simple. That's all that is. So now props are getting passed in this functional component. Everything's good. OK. Now state, this dot state in our, so, so creating state in our, um, we're creating state in our class component. And now we need to use use state instead. So. In our class component, we have this constructor. And in the constructor, we're creating some state right here. So this is where we're defining the state. All of these state variables here are actually going to be created using use effect now, or uh, use state, sorry. So we're going to have a use state for number to guess, number of guesses, and latest guess. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this whole thing right here. I'm going to go up here to the top of our function component, paste that. That's not going to work. Don't worry. I'm just putting that there so I can comment it out so we can refer to it. So now we can see we need a number to guess. So, so we're going to convert all these state variables to use state. So I'm going to say const number to guess. Oh, number taught guess, number to guess equals, oh, wait. Whoops. Number to guess, set number to guess equals use state. And then the initial value of number to guess here, the initial value is actually the result of calling this get random number function. And so I can do the same thing here. Just say the initial value, which we pass in right here, is actually going to be the result of calling get random number. So we're going to call the function in this argument here. And the random number that this function returns is actually going to get passed into use state as our initial value. We could do it that way. We could also do like const random num equals the result of calling that function and then pass this variable in. That's another way we could do the same thing storing it in a separate variable first. If that's easier for you to read, you can do that. But I'm just going to keep it the same, keep it like that. So we're calling use state, and then the, val the initial value is the random number. OK, so that's the number to guess. And then we're just going to go along to the next one, number of guesses, const number of guesses set number of guesses equals use state. And the initial value is 0. One last time, and instead of typing it all out, I'm just going to copy that one over. If you want to know how I did that, it's Alt or Option, and then Shift, and then Down. 
you can copy the same line over and over. Um, and I'm going to repl replace number of guesses here with latest guess. You can do Command D to select the same text. Um, I have it working to where it's case insensitive, so it'll select matching text even if it has a capital at the beginning, like the N right there is capital and like right there. You can change that in settings, and then you can also download a plugin that allows you to change it and preserve the case. So I'm going to replace number of guesses with latest guess. And as you can see, I typed latest guess, all undercase, and it actually auto capitalized the L there because the text I was replacing had a capital. If you want to know how to do that, it's uh, case. Case multiple cursor case preserve. <laughs> That's an extension that you have to get if you want to be able to do that to where it um, here they're replacing element and it's all capitals there. It's the first letter's capital, it's all lowercase, some other places. It preserves the case of whatever text you're replacing. So it's a good thing to have. Okay, and then the initial value of latest guess is going to be null, and then we're going to delete that because we got all the state. So remember, in our class component, we store all the state in the same object. In the functional component, we store them as separate object or separate variables using use state. So that should be all the same. So just undo that so you can see this in a class component translates to this in a functional component for setting the initial state. And I can probably check this off my list. Uh, oh, glad I put this here because I was going to forget. Remember to import use state. So use state is not imported here, and we need to import it. And the way to do that is trigger your uh, thing, and then do the update import from React, hit that, and then it'll add an import for you up here. Use state. If you want to do it manually, because that was automatic, if you want to do it manually, you'll just do a comma, use state here. For destructuring that off of the React object. OK, uh, that was that done. OK handler methods and handler functions. OK, yeah, so handler methods in the class are going to get turned into handler functions in our function component. So what are the handler methods? Things like handle guess, handle reset. I think that's it. Yeah. So let's copy these. These are the handler methods that Basically, we're probably passing these into user actions. So the user guesses, and then it calls this function, or the user hits the reset. Or I guess they don't hit reset. It might reset automatically. We'll see. Yeah, it would reset automatically, I think. Or maybe not. Probably. Yeah, that does. OK, so these are handler methods. So we're just going to copy those over. And let's put them under our state and above these like derived Booleans right here. Let's put it right there. And then these are actually going to be functions, not methods. Methods don't have to have a keyword function before them, but functions do. So it's going to be function. And OK, so that's that. Step six, ensure all this is are gone and also this dot states. So we have in a in a class component, we have all these refers or references to this and this dot state. So anywhere where we see this or this dot state, 
in our functional component, we just get rid of those. So delete all this is basically. So let's just go through and delete all this is. So we have a this here, and you have to delete the dot too. So instead of this dot set state, it's just going to be, well, actually, I mean, we, we can do that. Eventually, we're going to replace set state on the next step, I think. But, uh, this dot state, we just delete all together. So this, get rid of this is, and this dot states, delete those three right there. And this dot handle guess, this dot handle reset, this dot, okay, those are all this dot states, but we can do that. Okay, deleting all this is and this dot states. Okay, ensure all set states are replaced with individual use state setters. So if you remember in a class component, when we're updating state, we call this method that's like universal on the whole class called set state. And then we pass in an object with any of the new state properties because all the state is stored in the same object in a class. Here in a functional component, all the state is stored in separate variables and they all have their own setters. So we can see we have this because we ported this over from the comp the class component. We have this called a set state. These need to be replaced with individual uh, calls to the setters for the individual variables. So here, since we have set state and we're changing the latest guess and the number of guesses, we're going to have to call set number to guess and set number of guesses, these individual setters. So let's just comment this out so we can refer to it. And then I'll say, well, we're going to set latest guess to guess. So I'll say set latest guess, which should be here. Yep, our setter right there for latest guess. Set latest guess to guess. Guess can stay the same because guess is passed in right there. Now we're going to have to set number of guesses to number of guesses plus one. So let's copy set number of guesses, pass in number of guesses plus one. Optionally add semicolons. I have my formatter to where it adds semicolons for me. OK, so we did that. So these are equivalent. This is the class component way of doing it. And this is the functional component way of doing it. In a function component, all your state variables are stored separately. In a class component, all of them are stored in the same object. So in a class component, you call set state. In a function component, you use the individual setters for each state. So. Here we are changing latest guess and number of guesses. Here we changed latest guess and number of guesses. So we can delete that. We're done with that. Now let's comment this out and do the same exact thing over again. And I can do it faster this time. OK, set number to guess. And we're going to pass in get random number. Set number of guesses, and we're going to pass in zero, and then set latest guess to null. We can delete that. OK, sorry, I'm going to read the chat really quick. Remove the parentheses following get random number so that it's not called right away, right as, as it's being passed in as a parameter. Oh, OK.
Okay, so uh, Natalie said, get random number should actually just be passed in without calling it like that. Um, I think in this case, you do want to call it. I'm not sure if use state would call it for you. Maybe it does. Um, I have mine without parentheses following the function. Oh, really? And mine is working, and so I think that it should not have parentheses. Okay. In online 38 as well, when you're calling, um, when you're passing get random number to set number to guess. Okay. Yeah, so I think that'll work. Good call. I'm, I'm curious actually, like, that's probably something I didn't know about React. Um, how about I? How about I ask a chat GPT? I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, could you check out the line that I posted in chat to see if that works properly? Yep. So set number of guesses. And then you're passing in an updater function with number of guesses. Okay, so you have that set number of guesses and then passing in an updater function that has number of guesses plus one. Yep, that would actually work just the same. So there is one caveat. Uh, this shouldn't have curly braces around it. If it has curly braces, then it won't implicitly return. So you don't want curly braces around it or else it won't return. Otherwise, you need to write a, a specific like return. That makes sense. But uh, yeah, good call out. That, that does the same thing. And this is actually, uh, if you remember how updater functions work, this is actually technically the more like safer, better way in React of doing that. So these are basically equivalent. This second way using an updater function just gets around a bug that can potentially happen if you call, if you in the same block of code at the same time, you try to set that value uh, multiple times. Like if I were to have multiple of these, if I had it in this old way, if I had multiple of them, number of guesses would remain as stale data. And so it wouldn't get incremented by three here. It would just remain uh, whatever it was. And then the same thing will be applied three times. Here, we did that. It'll do what we actually would expect it to do, which is increment it by three times. If none of that makes sense to you, then uh, that's totally fine. But uh, good call out, Grant. This is definitely the better way to do it. That's what we're talking about, right? So. Yes. Okay. Um, what was I doing? I was helping. Natalie with a question, right? Oh, we, oh yeah, we, we, we solved that. It was not, not calling get random number, but just passing it as a function. That's something that I want to actually look up because, uh, I didn't know you could do that. And I'm, uh, I learned something today. So, um, yeah, cool. Okay. So where were we in this? We ensured all set states are replaced with individual use state setters. Okay, we're almost done. Comment out old class component. Okay, so so we're pretty much done. We just need to comment out the old class component, rename new func component, a new functional component with the same name. Okay, so this new functional component we have, this should be doing the same thing if we did all that right. This should have been the proper way to uh, refactor this class component here into a functional component. So now I can comment out this class component we don't need it anymore. I could even just delete it. Let's just delete it. And now our new component is this one. And I'm going to delete func from the name because we only had it there just to differentiate it so we didn't have a name clash. But now that I deleted the old one, this should be good. Props, well, I don't even think the other one is using props. Uh, but you just keep it in there. It doesn't really matter. It's just 
unused. If we did uh, need it, then we could use it. Uh, so we commented out the old component, replaced the new function component with the same name, and now we need to test it out and make sure it still works. Wait. So Can't props think. was necessary. Props was needed for the old variation of it because it needed to know that all oh, oh, this thing was accessible because it was extending to component. But this, you don't. It already knows that. Well, I mean, obviously, if you need a props, you need props. Wait, I guess the better question is: Did the old, did the class, the old class versions need to have props all the time? Nope. So the old, the old version, I, I'm pretty sure the old version would have worked fine without props. I think they just had that there, like, I don't know. And honestly, that that's where my knowledge of classes of functional or of React classes is starting to fall short. I'm I'm. I'm not sure whether a class component needs props or not. I, I do know that like here they're, oh wait, maybe they were using props, were they? Maybe they weren't. Let's see, I can go back. I can look at what the code looked like before. Uh, so they had a render. Oh, this is funny. It's showing my. So if you don't, if you don't know this, this is uh, using Git to peek at a previous version of your file. The red lines are deleted. The green lines are what you added. And so it actually shows the kind of combination now of like the differences between the the functional component and the. It's kind of confusing to look at, but I think if I look at this, I can find. And here we don't have any calls to props. And we use, we receive props, pass it into super. Um, you only need to do that if you're using props. If you're not, I'm pretty sure if you're not, then I don't think it matters. I think because that class component was not using props, I don't think it matters. I don't think we need it. And actually, we we could double check this. I know that it's not using props, this function, or this component, because let's find where we call the function and see if we're passing in props. So number guessing game. I can actually press Alter Option, click on it. It'll show me where we use it. So, so one way of doing alter option and clicking on something shows where where it is in your code, and then another you can when you actually are where you defined it, you can find where you use it. So I use it in this app file. So I import it and I use it here, and I can double click on that to open the file here. Number guessing game, this component that we just made, we're not passing in any props. So I know now this does not need props for sure. OK, let's let's test it out and see if the game still works. And remember, this component does like everything. This component is like the base component for the whole game. So if, if this is broken, we'll know it because the game will not work. So let's, and we're not going to go through a whole game again. Don't worry. I know we're exceeding our time limit. Not that we have one, but uh, it seems to be working. Oh, wait, 25. OK, seems to be working. So this, we properly refactored this. And so I'm going to do a little, maybe I'll do an even more celebratory. It's a good celebratory emoji. I guess this is a good one. We're done. OK. Now let's do a git commit and or git add and then commit. And we'll say refactor number guessing game component from class component to function. 
it's just your function component. Um, also, side note, just because I, I like dropping tips for just general development stuff here. Um, if you're working on your code, say you're working on like a, you know, a big code base and you're doing all sorts of stuff and whatever, um, it's important to have your commit messages be descriptive for the things that you've done because you might have a project with hundreds of commits from different people or thousands or millions. And if you don't have descriptive commit messages and it'll be hard to go back to specific points in your code and like, you know, see what, if you need to go back to a different version or, or see what broke or whatever. So be descriptive with your commit messages. And one way of doing that, if you forgot what work you did, if you're like, oh, what all did I do in this commit? I can't remember what I did since the last commit. You can actually go to your source control tab and it'll show you the changes you've made. And you can click on these files and it'll actually show you a view of what all you changed. So if you ever forgot, if you're trying to do a commit and you're like, oh, what did I do for this commit? You know, what all was the work that I did? You can actually go and look at what all the changes you made were. And for me, we're seeing some of the changes here are actually just like, see, I didn't, I didn't change this line or this file very much, right? The reason, <laughs> the reason this looks all funky is because my formatter prettier. Um, it likes double quotes. And so it replaced all the single quotes in this file with double quotes. And so it looked like I did a bunch of stuff, but I really didn't. Uh, that's one of the problems of having a formatter um, just taking over and changing everything is it makes it look like you're doing th things even though you're not. Um, anyways, just a little tip. You can see your your work in the source control tab. Okay, so we refactored this component to be a functional component, and now we need to do it again to another component. And if you want, you can stick around, and I'm going to do that, and it's going to be a lot quicker this time because I already went over it. So we're going to copy this and do these steps one more time. And I'm how would I do... Because I think all of you get the gist of it, right? So let's do a super, super speed round. Let's see how fast I can do this. <laughs> OK, function, guess control. OK, we did that. Now render method return. OK, so the render method, we're just going to do return that. Now. Props to props. So we're taking props here. And let's see if we actually use props. Yes, we do. Right here, this props on guess. So I'm just going to take on guess. Or wait, props dot on guess. Actually, I'll, I'll get there when I get there. Let's. This dot state turns to use state. OK, so this dot state. Uh, so we have one state variable called current guess, and it's an empty string. So const, wait, current guess. That current guess, use state. And we have to remember to import use state, set it to an empty string. OK, um, handler methods turn into handler functions. So I'll take these handler methods here, copy them, paste them there. Oh. oh, my multi select isn't working. I don't know why? Function, function. Um, ensure all this is are gone and also this dot states. Okay, so that can stay. This needs to go. Oh, this dot state needs to be turned into uh, set set current guess to 
event.target.value. Um, let's keep going with this. Uh, props can just be props. This dot set state. Well, again, it's going to be setting the current guess to an empty string here. Empty string. Um, Oh, there's more this is and this dot states. Okay. This dot state and this. Ensure all set states are replaced. Okay, we did that. Comment that old class comp okay. I think I think that was it. We need to make sure we have this export. Okay. Let's see if I did it. And what component was this? Guess control. So if we make a guess and it's wrong, then we know, or, or it doesn't work right, then we know we messed this up. I think it works. Okay. Looks good. We're done. Ryu, thanks so much for the explanation. I just have one question, which is a little bit trivial. Yeah. Um, how do you put emojis on Visual Studio Code? <laughs> good question. Um, I can't remember if I changed the default um, like uh, hotkey for it. But for me, it's on a Mac, it's control command space to bring up your gonna, emoji keyboard. Command I'm control try it space. Online. I could look it up. Mac open emoji keyboard. So you said command yeah. control space? Command control and space. Okay, let me try control alt space on my Windows. I have a quick Oh, you're on Windows. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was following along and I noticed when I copied uh it said when I have props on guests, it has a oh an endless type error, which says that um on guests is missing props validation. Oh yeah. So that would be uh an ES lint thing. Yeah. So uh, that is something that, let's see, I'll, I'll restore this back to what it was, which I think I can do that by going to source control. And let's find what I changed, ignore patterns, copy change lines. Okay, so restoring this file back to what it was, and then I imagine that should bring up the linting error, or maybe not. Maybe I need to reload. Because I, I know what you're talking about. I, I had that same error yesterday, and it was a linting thing. I'm pretty sure. Oh, yep, there it is. Okay. On guess is missing in props validation. So what that's saying is we haven't verified that props will actually have an on guess function. We don't know that that, that exists within this file. Um, because, well, where we, basically the JavaScript uh, static analysis or the JavaScript like compiler thing, or I guess it would be the LSP, the language server protocol. Whatever it is, it it doesn't know whether we are actually passing in this property on the props. Like 
as far as JavaScript knows, props is anything. Uh, this is something that TypeScript would solve. If you've heard of TypeScript, TypeScript uh, basically is JavaScript where everything, your, your like static analysis uh, knows what everything should look like. So things like this would not happen, but the way to deal with that is you could do, a, well, first of all, you could do get rid of ESLint, make ESLint not complain by doing that. Um, another way you can do it is, let's see, and I might reload the window again so I can get that error to show up again. Okay, another way to solve it would be click on it, click this little uh, code actions thing, and disable React prop types for this line or this file. This will add a comment. If I did it for the file, it'll add a comment up here. And this basically is just like a comment that tells ESLint something. So you can like configure your ESLint to do something different for a file. So we're saying ESLint, disable your check for React prop types. So that'll solve that too. But basically ESLint is going to be complaining about a lot of things in this file or in this whole project. And so I disabled it, but if you want to actually like address those things, you could well, you could change the rules in ESLint, which I don't recommend you try to do because that'll just, I mean, you could if you want. If you want to learn how to use ESLint and stuff, you could do that. But what this is really asking us to do is validate that on guess exists on props. So we could probably just do something like add a question mark here. Or no, that doesn't work. How about if props dot on guess and then move that into there? Does that work? No. Okay. If props dot on guess does not equal undefined, how about? No. Basically, we need a check. We need to make sure. So I'm gonna I'm gonna see what ESLint has to say about this error, because it'll probably say what it wants you to do. Examples of correct code for this rule. When was this written? This is strange. Two years ago? OK. It's fine. I I I get what you're getting at, and I get just don't worry about all the, the yeah. things that I think what I think one way to solve this would be it looks like destructuring. So we could say on guess. That? Oh. Nope. Same problem. I am curious how they want you to solve that though. That's like this this code that they wrote doesn't make sense to me, but I don't know, maybe I'm just not smart enough to understand. <laughs> Extends React component. Oh, maybe that's what they want. And then prop types. Public class fields. Static prop types. Oh, these are class components. Oh, so how do we do it in a function component? Oh, okay, like that. Hello dot prop type. Oh, okay, okay. So I'm gonna copy this right here. Here they're using name, which is a string that's required. So I've never seen this. It's a very strange looking syntax to me, but I'm just gonna copy and paste that. And hello is the name of their component. I'm gonna name it guest control. So guest control dot prop types. And then I guess this is like telling React 
what are the types of the props that are passed in. And we're going to have a prop called on guess. So we're going to change name to on guess. We probably have to import prop types. Right? Or no? Uh, OK. I'll ignore that for now. Uh, on guess needs to be a function. Wait, I, I think I need this type. Prop types. Where does that even come from? They don't show importing prop types. These docs are old and okay. Well, there you go. Import prop types from prop types. Like the first line of that yeah. sample copy. Oh, yeah. So I guess there's something called prop types, which honestly, like, I'm not sure if that'll work because I feel like prop types is not. Oh, it is. And in... so it must be included in the React thing, React package. OK. OK. So you add the import for prop types. Add that. It's not a string. It's, let's see. I think this is something where hopefully it gives me some auto suggestions for what this could be. Funk. Yeah. Is required. Oh. This is something where TypeScript would help make all this stuff better. But there we go. OK, so now it's not complaining anymore because we added this and we added an import for prop types. But still complaining about other stuff. OK, didn't need to do that, but that's, I guess I'm, uh, I'm showing how, like, when you, when you want to become a good programmer, let yourself be curious and, and find out those answers, you know, those questions where you're like, why does this work the way that it does? And like, the more you can like do a, a little mini dive into something and try to understand everything, like, that that's like today I learned how to do this and I'm glad I did. So anyways, um, thank you everyone. We got through it together. Um, any last questions before I wrap up or does anyone need a quick debugging session or anything? Thank you for today's lesson. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yep. I was wondering Thanks how to fix that problem myself, and instead I just turned off the linting for it. <laughs> yeah, turning off linting on this project is probably going to be nice. Going to get rid of all the complaining linting errors. Probably, but I think this is better. OK. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank rest you. of your week. I'll see you next time. Thank you. You too. Nice see you next week. Bye. Bye.